Um, all right, so today what, what I want to talk about, I'm going to have to be very quick because I have way too many slides. Um, as Jill said, it's, uh, the work that we've done in our office and the work that I've been doing at, as, a, as a teacher at Columbia in the School of Architecture has centered around digital processes and architecture and, and more specifically how uh, digital fabrication is changing the organization or the relationship between design and production, number one. And number two, and I think the thing that I'm most currently interested in is the, is the opportunities that this new organization is offering for younger practices. And I think that actually some of the people that are even part of this, uh, this event are examples of new forms of practice that are coming out and are emerging based on and kind of facilitated by these new digital processes. So I'm going to uh, quickly lay out a few themes and then show two projects that I worked on that really do kind of blend together the work that I do as a practicing architect and the work that I do uh, at Columbia University. It's the yeah, that's the okay. 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 Right. So I'm just going to start with a couple of kind of themes, really. Um, the first here is just it's a, it's a little graph that I often show in my lectures that talks about just the historical relationship of, of architectural design to industry, to the actual fabrication of buildings. And the diagram just kind of represents what I call as a kind of high point with the Dimexian House by Buckminster Fuller in the mid-20th mid century, and how close design was aligned with fabrication at that point. It kind of sinking to a low point with manufactured housing, and then uh, the current shift where, and this is the main point really I want to make in this slide, is that design and production merge into the common language of digital information. And that sounds kind of obvious, but it has fundamental uh, implications for architecture and building. And then a couple of shifts in themes, I would say, within certainly our work, and I would say even in architectural discourse in general, uh, kind of terms that, that I would associate with, uh, I'm not going to say old school, but I would say we're shifting kind of from these terms to these terms. Um, and some of the ones that are, that are maybe more interesting and relevant to what I'm going to talk about is the emphasis on collaboration. Uh, and this relates to these new types of practices that I was talking about. Design and management, this is one that kind of upsets designers often. When, when I kind of posit the, the, the thesis that management is actually a form of design, that it shouldn't be seen as something that's, that's bad, but in fact it really is something that's quite interesting. And then representation and communication. For me, digital processes are fundamentally about communication. It's not just about making things, which is very uh, interesting to architects and digital processes make that more uh, uh, easier to, to happen. But the fact that it sets up new communication networks is really what I consider the most important aspect of this. And then just quickly, kind of the title of what I was talking about, what I want to talk about today, design and design and design and assembly. Design and design is something that I just recently started thinking about. And again, it's a reevaluation of, of what the status of design is at this point. I think at this point we can't take design for granted, but we have to think about the actual process of designing design systems. And in architecture, this is playing out with scripting and with other forms of algorithmic processes where uh, you don't just kind of design in a kind of intuitive way, script it. You kind of mix that with more, uh, with more, what I would say, kind of quantitative ways of designing. So for us and for my own kind of thinking right now, it's this thin blue line that I'm most interested in, the relationship between kind of quantitative aspects of design and qualitative aspects of design. Okay, I'm going to show two quick projects, and they're both on Columbia University's campus. Uh, we've done quite a few projects up there, and these two, uh, one of them is built, and one of them is under construction right now. They're very small, but they're very, I think, important in the context of this discussion. The first one is a project, it's a slide library for the Department of Art History and Archaeology. Um, it's a very small project, it's essentially just one room, but the main focus of this project was actually not to get the design itself, but it was, it was uh, the, the process that we went to for, to kind of set up this new relationship between various constituents to make the project happen. Uh, there's very, this diagram kind of shows the typical process of, of building projects on, on a, a university campus, and this is what we were proposing for this project, which, which is to bring in 
number one, bring in the architecture school. I mean, there's architecture schools all over the country. They, they almost never have any impact on the actual building that takes place on campuses. So what we were proposing here is that the archi architecture school be part of that. Um, and along with that, just using, again, relationships between design and fabrication to do something novel and unique and actually uh, set up a kind of model for future ways of building. So I'm going to have to get through this quickly. I'm not going to get through it. But again, it was a slide library. Um, this was a diagram of how we actually set up the project. It was a relationship, again, between fabrication and assembly, and also between academic and professional. This is something that actually is, is I think, changing. And this is my kind of professor side coming out. Changing in, in, in the context of architectural education, where typically the academy kind of separates itself from the profession. Okay? And I think now what's starting to happen is that that line, is, which historically is so strictly drawn, is now being kind of reconsidered. And part of, part of before we did this project was to kind of work, where our office as a professional entity was working with, uh, with the Department of Architecture at the school and with the facilities departments to do the project. It's a small room, uh, kind of surrounded by offices in one of the neoclassical buildings at Columbia. Uh, and this is essentially the project. It really is just a box. But what we did is that um, there, were, there were four walls to the project. This uh, uh, east wall was the most kind of intensive in terms of design. And everything in the project was digitally designed and fabricated. We did no working drawings, no construction drawings. It was all done directly to our computer files, every single piece. So this wall was made up of 435 layers of MDF, which is just a, a, a solid wood. Um, it was kind of sandwiched together. And then the cutting files, the files which actually cut all of those profiles, were used to create a kind of perforation pattern on the other three walls. So in kind of communication terms, the instructions that built this wall were used to actually, uh, uh, let's say, create a pattern on the walls. So it's a very didactic process. These are all the cutting files that were used to cut that one wall, the 435 files. And we squeezed them down, both in height and in width, to create those three walls that I just showed. So this is essentially a compression of all those other files. Um, we did several prototypes during the process. This is just looking at different ways to to cut holes through the wall, like windows essentially, little apertures. Um, and we you know, we looked at different types and we opted for this one, which is more of a continuous smooth curve. Much more difficult to do, but it was interesting for us. And then we did prototypes for the perforations. Dash lines, solid lines, and we ended up going with, with this prototype. Um, Again, everything that was in the project was actually cut on a computer mill. Even if it was easier to cut it on a table saw, we were very strict about saying it has to be a completely digitally fabricated project. So these are the columns which support all the walls that are being assembled from all of these pieces. And then just the cutting, the, 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 the cutting of all the pieces. Um, another job that I have, a role that I play is as director of the digital fabrication lab at Columbia. We actually fabricated all of the pieces in the lab at Columbia. So it wasn't done by an outside vendor. It was actually done in the, within the architecture school. Uh, and as I mentioned, typically in architecture you do construction documents which are used to then build a project. With digital processes, I think the future is going to be such that you literally hand over a disk. And that disk becomes all, and it contains all the information that you need to actually build the project. So we were trying to, to um, create a similar process. All these are, are essentially assembly instructions. Think of a piece of IKEA furniture. You get all the pieces, they're all numbered, they're labeled, and then there's simple little diagrams that show you how all the pieces fit together. That's all there was in terms of instructions for how to put them together. So it just shows a kind of build up, a step by step process. And then um, many of the students at the architecture school were also involved with this. These are students actually assembling that wall with those 435 pieces. Uh, in between the, the, the solid wood, we have pieces of glass periodically. And that's what they're installing here. And there's a few images just of the finished, uh, the finished project, which I'll go through kind of quickly. This is the inside. This is